find out what's making you sick and how to heal. Anthony William is the medical medium. Hello, I'm Anthony William, and you're listening to the Medical Medium Radio Show, where each week I talk about the most advanced healing information out there so that we can move forward healing 10 years, 20 years, 30 years ahead of what's out there now and even longer. There's a reason for that, because you don't have that much time to waste or wait. And when people are, just the celery juice alone, I mean, how many people had to wait for that? Just just to find that out, even though I've been offering it for so many years, technology wasn't there for me to get the information out to the masses until in the last three, four, five years. And now people are like, oh my God, where's the celery juice been this whole life, my whole life? Where's it been? And I brought it out there for everybody. And that's the whole point. There's a reason. Because yeah, people are actually, their lives are changing. They could function, their anxiety, their depression, everything's reducing, everything's getting better. All kinds of things. People are, their gut, their gut health, all different kind of bloating, constipation, everything under the sun people have. And, 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 and just from that celery juice. And it's not, it doesn't stop there. The information on the Medical Medium Radio Show, but not just on the Medical Medium Radio Show, but in the books, the Medical Medium series, because that's where this comes from. We're talking about liver rescue. We're talking about the liver book. Because we're doing mystery hunger. Why are we always hungry? Are you always hungry? You know, we're talking about that today. And that's a really important thing to really discuss. It's it's an important topic. Um, And it's in the liver book too. I mean, have you ever run into people where they're hungry? They're always hungry. And they don't know why. Unsatiable, insatiable hunger where you just can't be satisfied, or if you're satisfied, it's temporary, or it's, or you just, you know, or it's just a wave where it goes, whoa, always hungry, always hungry, and then not hungry, hungry, always hungry, always hungry, and what is it? It's all this and then some. Advanced healing information is critical to help people heal, and that's what we're dealing with here, and that's like the celery juice alone is an example of that for the amount of people healing, and, and there's a lot of other jewels too that people need to know that are ahead of time. Mystery hunger. That's what I have. It's in this what I have in the liver book, in the liver rescue book. If you haven't gotten a copy, get yourself a copy. Go to a bookstore, whatever you wherever you get books. You can't afford a book, go to a, go to the library and get to take the book out. So you have it so you can heal. That's the whole point. That's what it's all about. And um, so let's go straight into it. Let's do this. You know, like weight gain, just like weight gain, mystery hunger is one of those health issues that is often treated unkindly. It really is. I mean, do do you know that? Like, have you ever experienced that? Because it's true. Where it's, it's, yeah, you can be treated unkindly with the whole thing. So that's just something to think about all. If you're dealing with that, like, nagging hunger that no amount of food can fill, just, you know, just take a light heart, have a light heart, because no matter how many others, how others might have treated you or what you might even think about yourself or, or, or anything about that, there's nothing wrong with you as a person. There's nothing wrong with you as a person. And this is really important to know. A lot of people struggle with this. And then they get the eating disorders and all everything else around it because they're always hungry and then they feel terrible about themselves. And they don't feel good about themselves in all kinds of ways. And then people might say stuff to them or the doctor or the practitioner or their loved one or their family friend or the family member or whoever it is or friend. You know, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not gluttony. It's not a character flaw. flaw. It's not a moral failing. It's not your fault. There's a very real explanation for why mystery hunger can plague somebody how it can plague us, and why. There's a real reason, and it's really advanced information, and we have to just keep that that feather in our cap, that you have that advanced information you're about to have, and that you have that. And that alone can empower you when you have the truth in your hand. It's so important, especially for this one, because people are always picked on. They are. They're always picked on with this one. This is a rough one. This one gets us in trouble. It really does. Look, compassionate practitioners who have taken up the cause of constant, unusual, or problematic hunger have brought different theories to the table. So different doctors have brought different theories to the table. You want to hear some of them? 
because I'm gonna I'm gonna give you these theories they brought to the table, and I don't like any of these theories. I'm just forewarning you right here. Fasten your seatbelts. You might even know some of these theories. Fasten your seatbelts. Take one, you know, get get some herbal tea. <laughs> relax a little bit. <laughs> I know somebody, if you tell them to relax, they get upset. You know, just like, no, just relax. It's going to be okay. And they get upset. And I understand. I get it. I get it. But just, we'll just, we'll all be kind of calm. Okay, so let's go into the theories. One is that it's a psychological overeating disorder. That's a theory. That's a theory. Psychological overeating disorder. So when someone's always hungry, or they're just binging because they're always hungry and everything else. Um, and whether they whether they satiate themselves or not, and then go back to just the insatiable hunger and everything else, it one of the theories is it's psychologically overeating disorder. That's one of the theories. Let's go into another one. Another theory is that their hunger, that their hunger shutoff switch is malfunctioning due to a brain disorder. So their their shutoff switch. Is malfunctioning. Some kind of do 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 hormone, do 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 something that's going in the brain. Ooh, ooh serotonin. Oops, something's going on. Whatever it is, <laughs> you know, there's something going wrong. And that, that's just a theory. You gotta remember this. You can have all the science you want in the world. All the science, which listen, I, I, I haven't said this part in a while. I might have so, said it in the back in the past few shows, but it's important to know if you've just tuned into this and you're like, what is this guy, anti science? That's not, you know, what is this guy? A science has everything down. What's he talking about? Medicine is every, well, he knows more than somebody. Well, listen, I run into people all the time over the years. They've gone to unbelievable schools, elite schools, you name it, and they're in their 20s and they get sick or they're in their late teens, or in their 20s, or they're in their early 30s, then they get sick. And they realize it's not just, oh, I got a cough, let me go to the doctor and get an antibiotic. They realize it's not like on a ski trip, I broke my ankle on a ski accident. You know, and science has it all wrapped up. You know, just get fix the ankle, get it, you know, walk it off for six months or whatever. I mean, get a, get a crutch, get crutches. That's what I mean. And... And, you know, they think it's that. Or, or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something else. It's depression. Go get a pill. Take a pill. Take a benzodiazepine. Make it go away. And, and what happens is a lot of people I've noticed that, that are in their 20s, I've talked to over the years, including now that they're in their early 30s, whatever, young people, and they're like, and they're shocked. They're in shock when they get chronically sick. They're in shock. It's almost like the world is coming to an end, rightfully so, it feels like that, because science and research knows nothing about chronic illness, nothing, nothing, I swear to God, nothing, (laughs) nothing, I don't care what fancy clinic, I don't care where you think you're going, whatever clinic, fancy clinics, blah, 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 you know how many people with CFS go in there? They still don't get answers, and now they all get the tag Lyme now, and they're still just swimming in the in, in in abyss of no information. It's unbelievable. You should have seen what it was ten years ago. It's worse. I mean, people more people are sick than ever before now than ten years ago. But I'm just saying, it was so bad you couldn't even get a, a half crackpot answer out of any of the best elite places. And 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 I'm telling you, college kids get all set. They get sick now. They're sick. Seventeen out of a hundred, roughly. And it's rising. End up never working. Five years never working. Eight years. Went to school. They're just home. Living with their parents in bed. Sick. And it's like this crushing, crashing, like, enlightenment of, wait a minute. I, I, I came from these elite school, or I came from any school, or I came from any kind of college, or I came from whatever raising and understanding, or whatever education, high school education, or wherever you come from. Or whatever kind of place you come from, or whatever it is, you get the understanding. Science and research has it all down, and chronic illness is like, what? What do you mean there's no answers for MS? What do you mean there's no answers for Hashimoto's? What do you mean there's no answers for rheumatoid arthritis? What do you mean the body's attacking itself? What do you mean there's no answer? There's no nothing. They don't have all the mystery symptoms. And so anyone who's just tuning on to the show, you have to understand something. It's not that I'm anti-science. A man type bullcrap of of everybody thinking science has it all wrapped up. Professionals included that think that when it comes down to chronic illness, because they don't. They don't. I'm sorry. 
There's a whole chapter in this book that says a note for you at the beginning of this book, Live a Rescue, and I explain the whole thing front to back of how it works if you're interested. It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's, it's really powerful, too, to know the truth with this. And so if you got hunger and got constant hunger and, you know, you, you run into compassionate practitioner, doctor, so forth, they can think psychologically you got an overeating disorder. Sure, sure, that's one theory. It's a theory. It's not what it is. Another theory is that their hunger shut off switch, like I said before. It's kind of cockeyed. It's kind of off. It's kind of kaput or just out of, you know, nuts and bolts aren't working right on that shut off switch. And so, you know, the shut off switch, it's the manufacturing due to a brain disorder or a shut off switch theory due to a stomach disorder. Due to a stomach disorder where you can't get enough food, you're always hungry and everything else around it. So that's, a, that's another theory. Are any of these theories correct? Are any of them correct? Nope. Sorry, they're not. They're not correct. So that's the whole thing there. And then you have, and then you have, you have another theory too. Here's another theory. This is a good one. Hunger is hormonal. It's hormonal. So when a woman is pregnant, ovulating, premenstrual, menstruation, menopause, or coming off menopause, you know, anything like that, and feels famished or the impulse to binge eat, it will often be blamed on hormones. So that's the whole thing there. It'll often be blamed on hormones. And that's another tricky one. That's a really tricky territory because that's not correct either. That theory, everything's, but everything wrong with someone, a woman with chronic illness on any level, going back 80 years now is blamed on something hormonal now. 70 years now, it's blamed on something hormonal. It's unbelievable. Not 70 years, let's say 60, 65 or something, whatever it is now, that amount of years in what, in 1940s, 1950s, and then near early 1960s. So what, however time that is now. Maybe it is 70 years. But the bottom line is, that's a big one too. So it's blamed on ovulation. It's blamed on uh, premenstrual menstruation, menopause, or anything like that. A pregnancy. And it's blamed on hormones. And hey, you know, that's not true. That's not accurate either. It's not. But that's a whole other thing. Let's keep on going with a few more of these. And then... Lately, another theory, this is a good one too, another theory that's, that's gotten a lot of attention, it's hyperthyroidism. Many people are told that an overactive thyroid is causing them to have a heightened metabolic rate, which means they'll burn more calories faster than normal. Funny, most, hypothyro- most hyperthyroid, not hypo, hyperthyroid people have weight gain. Oh, that's really funny. Unbelievable. And, you know, they're not skinny as a rail. Sorry, they're not. You know, that's a whole other mistake that happens. So anyway, they get hungrier more than normal. Their metabolic rates up. They're losing all this weight. That's not even accurate for hyperthyroidism. Hyperthyroidism is not even accurate. There's also the theory that the extra weight someone's carrying around is the very source of their mystery hunger. Oh, they're so big. They're so big that they got to eat more. And that's really a disgusting, demented theory. And I hate that one. That's just unfair. And it's wrong because it's not even, it's not correct. And it's wrong anyway. So someone's carrying around extra weights. So they must be extra hungry. That's ridiculous. It has nothing to do with that. It's so disheartening. And then there's another theory, too. Let's keep on going on to these theories. I didn't even know I had so many. <laughs> so many of other people's theories to report. They're not my theories. <laughs> boredom. That's a good one. Boredom. So boredom is put out there as a theory. It's a whole other thing. If boredom was put, is put out there as theory. So so is SAD. That's another one. Seasonal affective disorder. That's a complete total theory. Depression. Another theory. Diabetes. You know, that's another theory. And finally, 
We have the theory that this that the discomfort of acid reflux. We have a theory that the discomfort of acid reflux causes it causes kind of and can prompt someone to want to eat all the time. It could prompt somebody to want to eat all the time. Let me tell you something. Make no mistake. These remain theories, unproven. Exactly. All science and research in chronic illness are, is theory. Did you know that? Is theory in chronic illness. It's theory. You guys probably didn't know that, right? doesn't matter how many papers were published. It's still theory. Yeah. Pretty crazy, huh? Pretty crazy when you think about it. Yeah. And even when science and research has something really perfectly like a device, like a heart monitor, it still can malfunction. Even something that's nuts and bolts with a little chip in there, something that's supposed to work indefinitely, screws up all the time on people. Science and research can't even get something with nuts and bolts right. But yeah, they got great stuff too. Don't get me wrong. So many great things. I never doubt that are the people working in the field. Believe me, I don't. It's just that I can't be in denial and I can't pretend science and research has it all together because if I do that, I just screwed you guys over big time because what happens is I'm just going to fall into that thing where it's your fault, faulty genes, your body's attacking itself, or it's all in your head, or you got Lyme disease, blah, 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 and it's bacterial, and that's what it is. You got bit by a tick 50 years ago. Whatever it is, it's not going to be right, and you're going to be cheated. If you got Lyme, go to my first book, Medical Medium Book 1, and say it every time. Get the Lyme disease chapter out of there. Learn what Lyme really is so you know. But make no mistake, these are all remain theories. They still are. They're unproven possibilities floated out there in the world in hopes of offering patients the feeling of having an answer. And I respect that. I respect that. You don't have an answer. You don't have an answer. I respect that. I do. I do, I do, I do. Even though they aren't true, truly, truly answers, all of the theories above, the oldest one in the book is that it's psychological and it's all in your head. That's one of the, of all of the theories above, the oldest one in the book is that it's psychological and all in your head. It's also one of the most painful diagnoses to receive. You know, it can make you feel like you're at odds with yourself and your own mind, odds with who you are, and that really stinks. It really stinks. You know, and food isn't one of those elements we can remove from our lives entirely. Sure, let's just stop eating. No, 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 no. So the challenge of simply eating less or ignoring the persistent tug in the gut, asking for more food is insurmountable for so many people. It's unbelievable. And let's not even, oh my God, let's not discount eating disorders. It's true some of us overeat. It's true because we're trying to sue the different, difficult situation in our life, difficult times, difficult problems, difficult emotions, and that food and trauma and addiction can wrap all into one another. I totally get it. We can eat because we're under stress. Damn right. You better believe it. But this isn't the whole picture, though. This, this isn't the whole picture. It's not that. That's not, this isn't the whole picture. It's more to it than that. There's causes of mystery hunger, you guys. There is. When, when food addiction isn't involved because, because of a problem that you're experiencing under massive stress or whatever it is, and it's how you learn to cope. And even then, there's a reason why you're eating when we're under stress because something needs to be fed. And I'm going to tell you what it is. Get ready because we're looking at the book, Liver Rescue. We're working on the book, Liver Rescue, the whole bit. There's something that needs to be fed. It's called a starving liver. A starving liver. There's an organ inside of us. And it goes hungry. Hungry, hungry. And I'm going to tell you how and and tell you why. It goes hungry. It goes starving. It needs to eat is what it does. Really important to know. Because 
This is why we have this insatiable hunger. This is also why we even partly stress eat under stress because the liver needs more fuel. And there's a reason because it's it's using the glucose to sop up adrenaline from being backstabbed, betrayed, or a loss, or brokenhearted, or damaged, or injured, or whatever it is. And our soul gets hurt. And our soul gets problematic. And we, we, we struggle. We suffer. You better believe it. And our liver asks for more food. Yeah, it's a big deal. And I'm going to explain why the injured workings and the science that's not discovered yet either. I'm going to explain why on that too, because you need to know. So what is our liver starving for? What is our liver hungry for that's making us want to eat and eat and eat? What is our liver looking for? It's looking for critical, clean carbohydrates. It's looking for C, C, C is what it's looking for. That's what our liver wants, CCC. That's what it wants. But how can a liver be even starving if someone's eating all the time? How can it even be starving? Think about that. Because a starving liver is not a liver that's hungry for fat calories. That's why. That's why. And everybody's eating fat calories. A starving liver is not hungry for fat calories. It's hungry for carbohydrates. It's hungry for glucose to actually restore its glucose reserves. Those glucose reserves stop you from getting diabetes. But when we bombard ourselves with fats all the time with the carbs or fats by themselves, we're starving out our liver all the time because the liver can't access glucose from the blood. If fat is always in there, it has to instead get bombarded by the fat and have to take in the overt fat that's floating around in the bloodstream that goes up the hepatic portal highway up into the liver. It has to constantly reabsorb fat and and figure out what to do with it. And know what it ends up doing? It's storing it, killing the liver. So you lose CCC, critical clean carbohydrates. You lose those. I mean, this is serious. You don't think it's serious? It's serious. It's, this is a big deal because we're always on fat. Everybody's on fat all day long. Everybody is. There's very few people. They're all on some kind of fat. They might hide, hide it under the guise of protein. I just had my protein. What was it? What was the protein? You just, I just had some, some lean meat. Yeah, I had some lean pork. I had some lean beef. I had some lamb. I had some chicken. But that's, that's fat in there. Lots of it. You don't have to eat the chicken skin. You, you mean you don't have to eat the chicken skin to, to actually think you're, that's where the fat is. It's not. It's inside of it. It's everywhere. It's inside of the chicken meat. Of course it is. It's the juice in a steak. It's the juice. It's the fat. That's what it is. Because fat actually runs through all meat. It's just what it does. Forget the meat stuff. Forget the, the, the animal the, the kingdom. Let's go into let's go into vegans, vegetarianism, and all that. If you want vegetarians to eat a lot of fish, that there's some fats in that. Think it's all protein? No, it's fats. It's fish oil. You think fish oil is good for you? You think again. Fish oil is not good for you. I know that's a bust, brain buster right there. Total brain buster. But it's not. It's not good for you. I mean, little traces of it could be fine. Little traces of it, but a lot of it's not good for you. It's not. And you know, that's the whole thing. And if you're vegetarian, you're doing eggs. There's the fat again. There's the eggs, egg fat. There's the fat. That's right. And if you're doing dairy products, cheese and all that, there's the fat again. If you're vegan, it's all the nuts. Every day, it's the nuts. Sesame tahini, nut butters, nuts in the hands. You know, putting, you know what I mean? Like eating them out of hand, all that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, about the, it's always about something like that and oils and then avocado and everything else. So it's about the fats. I'm not saying all these are bad. I'm not saying all of these are bad. I'm not saying animal proteins are bad. I'm not saying the nuts are bad. I'm not saying all this kind of thing are bad. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is it's that high fat, high fat diet that we're constantly under all the time and we're eating less leafy greens, less leafy greens. Because there's something else that stops the liver from being starving, and it's called mineral salts. That's why celery juice literally changes and shapes the lives of people so they can get out of even this condition because it's a miracle juice for all kinds of conditions, but especially this one, especially mystery hunger. 
And so when the liver's starving, the liver's starving, it's starving. That's the bottom line. It's starving for glucose and mineral salts. Yes, critical clean carbohydrates. What is that? Sweet potato? What is that? Regular potato? Yukon gold? Russet? Red potato? Purple potato? Yeah. What, what, what else is critical clean carbohydrates? Some carrots are too. Yeah, sure. What else? Fruit of all kinds. All critical clean carbohydrates. Fruits, fruits, fruits. Exactly. And then what else is the liver? Well, you might say, hey, I've eaten that. I've eaten a couple apples. I ate this. I ate that. Sweet potato. But you're having fat somewhere in the diet. And that stops the critical clean carbohydrate from absorbing into the liver, from it actually receiving it. So it can store up its glucose. And then guess what? Send out a signal to shut down the hunger. Send out a signal to the brain to shut down the hunger. Exactly. But it's always going to be crying out hungry. The liver's always going to be crying out hungry. It's always going to be doing that. Crying out for hunger all the time. Looking for help. And what we do is we bombard it with fats. Overt fats, whatever you want. It, proteins. So let's just say proteins because it's fats. That's what the proteins are. Unless you're getting your protein from a leafy green. Unless you're getting it from a leafy green. And don't get fooled by pea protein powder. That's, that's, that's carbohydrate. It's actually not so bad because that's carbohydrate. Dried peas is, is, is pea, is, is the whole thing is it's a carbohydrate. And, but protein, it always comes with fat. It's like nuts or protein it has the fats in it. It's a protein source. Fish, protein, well, it's got the fat in there. Any kind of chicken, turkey, whatever, it's all, it's all got the fat in there. And these are, you know, this is, this is where we get tricked. So we're on these high fat diets all the time. And then we're always making, even though we don't want to be on high fat all the time, we're always making mistakes. We're always eating fats anyway. We're going out to dinner. We're having it on a salad. I'm having a salad, but you got all the salad dressing on there filled with fat. And then you got a hard boiled egg in there mixed in there too. Got pieces of ham in there. Maybe you're doing a chef salad, whatever it is. Got fats in there everywhere. And what happens is fats inhibit Glucose from entering into cells of organs easily or with ease. And organs desperately need glucose. The heart is a muscle that has to get glucose or it weakens. And as the years and decades go by and you're on the high protein, high fat diets and not getting the sugars that you are eating aren't getting into the right place, you could be heart attack bound. No matter how good of shape you're in, the best damn shape you think you're in. Where you got rock hard abs, all of that can still have a heart attack. You better believe it. The heart can still weaken. Seen it happen for decades to people. And so the liver is the canary in the coal mine. It's it's that's the whole point. It's the real canary in the coal mine, and it's reaching out. It's asking for help. It's putting out SOS SOS. You know, feed me, make sure you get that food to me, uh, keep on eating. Yeah. And if you're under stress, under stress, and that's why you're eating because you're under stress and you're under all this stuff and you're bombarded with all this stressful torture and all this stuff. You're allergic to somebody that's torturing you, whatever it is that's going on that people have to go through every day or losses or betrayal or trust being broken or relationships, somebody cheated on you, whatever it is and you're getting hit by all this, you're going to want to eat. You might actually not eat at all for a while. You might shut it off, be like, I can't eat a thing. I'm too sick over all this stress. But then later on, you're going to go into heavy eating down the road, and it's going to be insatiable because the liver's still going to call out for food. And it's going to call out, especially when you're under stress, it's going to call out for more food, and there's reason for that. And if mentally our soul gets injured by some kind of stressful situation, we stop eating because our soul is inside of our brain. Our, our actual brain says, no, we don't want to want food. I'm hurt. I'm hurt. I don't want food. I'm emotionally hurt. And you starve yourself for a little while, and it happens to all kinds of people. It happens to women a lot. It happens to girls a lot. It happens to guys a lot. It just happens where it's, I'm not hungry. I can't eat. And your stomach shrinks, and you got an eating disorder for a while because you've been brokenhearted. And now you're in a jam 
And when that happens, your liver starves more and more and more, but you don't hear the signal when you're under that kind of stress and problems and everything. You don't hear the signal because you're mentally tortured for some, for some, some reason, for something that happened. Some even a stressful event at work, or you've been fired, or something happened, or whatever it is. You, you actually can't think about food. It makes you sick if it even sits in your stomach. But the liver has to wait patiently, sending out signals until finally the emotional pain eases off and a little time goes by. And when it goes by and the emotional pain eases off a bit, the liver, what does it do then? Sends out the signal stronger than ever. Oh my God, stronger than ever. I want glucose. I need critical clean carbohydrates. But you're not going to give it clean. No one gives it critical clean carbohydrates. No one gives it mineral salts and critical clean carbohydrates. What's it, what are those again? Like I said, fruit, sweet potatoes, whatever, potatoes, you know, whole foods that are starchy or just sweet. And you're not going to give it that. You might give some carbohydrates in there. You might start eating and who knows what, but it's going to have fats in there. You're going to have pizza. It's going to have oil, grease, oil, grease, cheese. You're going to have that in, on your bread with your sauce. So the liver is trying to get some kind of carbohydrate from that wheat bread or any kind of bread. It's trying to get a critical clean carbohydrate. That's not a clean carbohydrate. It's trying to get a clean carbohydrate from something. But the fats on the pizza are going to inhibit it and stop it. And then it's going to starve again. You're going to want pizza again. You're going to want more pizza again. You're going to want more. Now you feel like you got an eating disorder. Now you got to get into the gym or now you got to whatever it is. Now you got to try to like beat out your eating disorder that you think you have and everything else around it. But really the liver is just calling out for help, calling out for help, calling out for help. That's what it's doing. That's what it's doing. Yeah. And it happens to the best of us. It happens to the best of us. It's easy to happen here on planet Earth. It's really easy. It could happen just in a heartbeat. You better believe it. So what can we do? What is really happening overall? How can a liver be starving if someone's eating all the time? I just answered all that. Because a starving liver is not a liver that's hungry for fat calories. That's the whole point. It's a liver that's run out of glucose, for God's sake, and glycogen reserves, which is glucose compacted practically into tissue for, for like long-term life-sustaining fuel. Keep you alive keep you alive to your 80s, 90s, 100s. That's the whole point. We lose all that. We're just, we're on just, we're on fat, fat diets all the way. See, because people can't drop their fats easily. Experts lately, they're just seeing just people's lives decline. So they're like, get off of sugar, get off of processed foods, get off of this. They think that's the enemy. Because they think, well, fats and proteins are all part of our life here on planet Earth. It's not true. Those have to be minimized. And instead, the sugars need to be increased. And I'm not talking about table sugar and corn syrup sugar. And I'm not talking about that. But sugars need to be increased. And so does mineral salts. Now, if you're somebody, you're totally turned off by that because it's everything against the grain out there. Fine. Fine. I respect that. I respect that. It's fine with me. That's fine. But you got to know, you got to know that you can run from the truth all you want, but you can't hide because you can't because you're going to need the truth someday down the road, whether you realize you should have taken the truth 20 years from now <laughs> or you take it now to one or the other. So, I mean, the bottom line is, we need the critical clean carbohydrates. That's what I'm talking about. So liver stressors. I was going over some liver stressors in a whole bit. Let's cover a few of them. So how do we run out of the liver's glucose that I keep on saying? A glycogen storage is so critical. How do we run out of that in the first place? What's going on there? I didn't cover that, I don't think. Like, what's happening there? That's what, that's what we need to talk about. Well, one frequent stressor is pathogenic activity, pathogenic activity, that is. It's a viruses and bacteria that sit in the liver feeding on a storage of poisons such as toxic heavy metals, aluminum, mercury, cadmium, lead, nickel, arsenic, copper. The list goes on. There's more than that. Steel. Yeah, steel. Alloys. You name it. 
all inside there. So the high, toxic heavy metals, and there's sludge from byproduct from these viruses that feed off of toxic heavy metals. Tons of sludge builds up, builds up in the liver, builds up in the liver, builds up in the liver. You don't think you get a virus in the liver? <laughs> you know, good for you. Good for you. I mean, I'd like to live in denial in not different parts, parts of my life or anything else. I wouldn't mind that. That'd be great. That'd be great. You know, like <laughs> bad news you get and stuff like that. Nope, didn't hear it, didn't hear it. Everybody's got viruses in the liver. I don't care who it is. They all have a virus in the liver or more or more or more. People have different kinds, you name it. It's how we get sick later on. If you don't get sick now and the next thing you know, you're in your 40s, your blood pressure goes up, weird things happen. It's all because of viral stuff inside the liver. Get hot flashes all because of viral stuff inside the liver. It's just, it's over and over again. It's just no, no matter what, it all just kicks our ass down the road somehow. You can do something about it though. You can do something about it. So byproduct from these viruses, sludge and other pathogens, bacteria, strep. You don't think everybody has strep? Some people have five varieties inside of them. Some people have one. Some people have eight varieties inside of them. There's so many mutations and so many different groups of strep. They can't even keep track of them. They don't even have their finger on the pulse of strep. It's everywhere. And then you got the plastics in there, petroleum from drugs. You got drug residue in there in the, in the, in the liver, right? The viruses feed on all of this. The virus leaves waste. Viruses leave waste products, creating a larger landfill deep inside the liver, which gives the liver a greater struggle to fuel itself, to get the food it needs. Glucose, the glucose it needs. Pretty amazing, our livers. They're just pretty amazing overall. I mean, seriously, just mind-boggling. They really are. The Epstein-Barr virus, you guys, you know that you can go to thyroid healing. You can learn about Epstein-Barr. It's the most common pathogen that takes up residence inside our liver totally. That's the most common one, without a doubt, that sits inside our liver and messes around in there. And it's a big deal. So that's just one thing. And then there's the weight gain because weight gain occurs because the liver gets so worn down by having viral issues inside and all the toxins and all the different things and it builds up. Some people it hits earlier, some people it hits later. Sluggish liver is a big part of this. Fatty liver is a big part of it. Yeah, it's a big deal. Someone may remain thin for 10, 20, 30 years and then finally around age 50, the burden that the liver was carrying for all those years catches up with them. Someone will be told your metabolism finally slowed down with aging when in reality, uh uh-uh, the liver became clogged up and dogged. It's dogging it. And it can get unclogged if you work with it. It can get unclogged if you work with it. So, you know, when someone experiences mystery hunger and is overweight, it's a sign of pre-fatty liver, fatty liver, the whole bit. And that's a big deal. It's a sign of organ stress, liver stress, hindering its capacity to receive glucose and store it to stop you from being hungry. Look, we're supposed to get hungry. Don't get me wrong. We're supposed to get hungry. We're supposed to. It's true. But this is a little different, everything we're talking about. So these are all, look, it's common that people going through an emotional crisis like the loss of a loved one or a breakup will stop eating, I told you that, because their minds take over and the adrenaline consumes them, but that weakens the liver too. Like I said, it's not just the sludge from viruses, it's not just all the other toxins, it's not just the heavy metals, it's also these other things like adrenaline that cause problems and they get us in trouble. They get the liver gets in trouble from it. So when we eat fat all the time, and we're eating fat and protein, thinking protein's not fat when that's not true. And nowadays, you know, they're, they're actually, what they're doing out there, they're actually saying fat's good now. Okay, fat's good now. Great, we're going to go back to that. You know what's incredible about conventional medicine, you guys? When conventional medicine discovers something truthful that's amazing, Because, you know, the guys and gals in the medical industry realized this years ago. 
but then it gets lost in the woodwork is the most painful thing. But it's amazing. Conventional medicine, when it surprises you, when it, when it knew the higher the fat your diet, the more for heart disease, the more for heart attack, the more for stroke, the more for disease overall because of high fat. That this is the, now that all that's ignored. That used to be the consensus in the conventional minded, in the conventional minded. That's what it used to be. And on the shelves, store shelves, fat free products everywhere, but they weren't always good. They were just filled with all kinds of preservatives and garbage and everything else. It's just terrible. It was a terrible time back in the 70s, back in the 80s. But doctors knew high fat meant a lot of fat buildup. Build up in organs, build up in, in the arteries, build up in the heart. And sure, you know, hey, look, there's good fats, without a doubt. Hemp seeds are amazing. You eat too many of them, though, you bog down your liver. And you still get your blood too thick and fat, and you don't get glucose to everything like your brain, and then you don't get glucose to your liver, and you get a, you get a problem. Avocados are really healthy fat. You eat too many of them every day. You just you starve your body of glucose because all that fat stops sugar from going into the cells. It stresses out the pancreas, stresses out the liver, and once again, your liver starves, and it's going to end up getting hungrier and hungrier over time. Nuts and seeds, high-quality fats, absolutely. Flax seeds, still high-quality fat. Like I said, hemp seed, chia seeds, still high-quality fat. Not bad at all. Not bad at all. Pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, absolutely. I'm not saying you can't eat these. You can eat them. Fish, pretty good source of fat. Some of them. Sardines are a really good source. But, I mean, if you want to eat these things, you could eat these things. You could have some salmon, but the point is, you got to be careful because you eat too many of these. And you still, yeah, shorten your life. You still do. You can shorten your life. The liver gets fatty, even if you're exercising, even if you're doing whatever, even if you're feeling good, it'll get fatty, fatty, fatty. And then there's people that are actually... You know, struggling with their liver from day one. They're sick. They got autoimmune because, yeah, they got viruses causing inflammation because that's a true autoimmune, not the body attacking itself. And, man, the fats aren't helping them at all. You take them off of fats and you got them on leafy greens and berries and leafy greens and fruit and leafy greens and potatoes. Their lives change and celery juice, mineral salts and spinach and mineral salts and their lives change and they come out of it. It's unbelievable. Take somebody that's on animal protein that's sick. You bring in more leafy greens and celery juice. They, they get better. They get better. But you got to remember, you got to bring in all, you got to bring down the fats. You got to lower them down and you got to bring in the CCC. What's the CCC again? It's critical clean carbohydrates. Yeah. Apples are a critical clean carbohydrate. It's the cover of the Liver Rescue book. There's a big, nice, big, juicy apple on the front cover for a reason. It cleanses the liver, feeds the liver like no other, hydrates the liver like no other. The apple, it has hydration in it. Water molecules that actually get stored inside the liver. The liver holds onto it like a camel in the desert, saving its life for a rainy day. The apple has glucose in it. It's, you know, fructose. Oh, don't be afraid of that word fructose. Whatever you do, you're just going to cheat yourself. Yeah, you're just going to cheat yourself. So the bottom line is, the bottom line is you want things like the apples, you want the berries, you want the melons, you want the grapes, you want the bananas. Yes, you want the bananas. You better believe it. You want the bananas. You want the apples, peaches, plums, nectarines, mangoes, papaya. You want the papaya. It refuels the liver. And then you want the mineral salts, the celery juice. You want the spinach salads every single day. Spinach salads, tomatoes, cucumbers thrown into your salads. Absolutely. If you want a little bit of fat, you want a little bit of avocado in there, you want some hemp seeds thrown on there, you can do it. If you're somebody that's big into chicken, have a little bit of chicken once a day. Keep it open for everything else for the rest of the day. Keep it open for leafy greens, smoothies with fruit in them. 
Try not to bombard all the nut oils and try not to, you know, bombard all the nut butters and try not to throw in all the coconut oil. You're just going to get yourself in trouble. They're all good for you. They're all good for you. Fats, there's nothing wrong with it all. But if you just don't lower your fats, you're going to get in trouble because you're never going to learn how to eat right. And if it's working for you now, it's going to kick your butt later on. It's going to kick your butt later on, whether it's insatiable appetite, always being hungry, or just getting sick because that's what happens. Even the best Fats can get you sick. They're not toxic. It has nothing to do with that. It just slowly burns the liver over time. Slowly creates insulin resistance over time because your liver is getting burdened down. Slowly causing havoc over time because glucose isn't getting into all the places like it needs to be, like your brain, your heart, your liver, so it can save your butt and, and bring you to... So my voice is getting... My throat's getting dry. Save your butt and bring you to the finish line. And get you to where you need to go. It's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Nothing like a tickle in your throat, always at the wrong time. But the bottom line is, you can do it. You can do it. How can you do it? Bring in spinach every single day. Make the spinach soup every single day. Go into the medical medium, liver rescue. Get the fat-free recipes. There's a bunch of them in there. Get the fat-free recipes. And actually... You know, bring it in. Have three apples a day. Don't have one apple a week. Have three apples a day. And what's going to happen is a miracle occurs with your health. You literally can avoid illness and start to heal in unimaginable ways. It's that critical. It's that amazing and that important. Simple as that. You bring in a few more apples a day. That's right. Bring in some papaya. Bring in pataya. But Thai dragon fruit, frozen dragon fruit, one of the amazing secret weapons that I have in Liver Rescue book for bringing back your liver. And then bring back those to bring in those tomatoes. Don't be afraid of tomatoes. Bring them in because they're life protecting, liver protecting, liver saving. Those tomatoes are unbelievable. And don't be afraid of that. Celery juice every single day, 16 ounces of celery juice every single day. 16 ounces of celery juice to 32 ounces of celery juice. Do 40 ounces if you really want. If you love it that much, if you can't do any of that, do six ounces. Do five ounces. Can't do celery juice at all for some reason, even though babies are drinking it. You go to my Instagram page, you get babies drinking celery juice. They're just gobbling down full glasses of celery juice babies. And then I got these 50-year-olds and these 40-year-olds. They're like, they won't even take two sips of celery juice. They say it gives them bloat or something. And you got babies all over the country and all over the world that are drinking celery juice. (laughs) I know. I'm just picking. I'm picking on everybody now. I get it. I get it. But it's true. (laughs) It's true. (laughs) Oh, my God. It's true. (laughs) So, (laughs) all right, we can do it. We can bring in the mineral salts. We can. We can bring in your spinach salads. Bring in some sprouts. They got mineral salts in there. It's amazing. Bring in some sprouts. Asparagus, that's a great one. Steam artichokes, incredible. Brussels sprouts, incredible. Bring all these in. Cauliflower, broccoli, you could steam them if you want. Raw cauliflower is actually good. Make cauliflower rice. There's some mineral salts in there. Throw some tomatoes in there. Do whatever you need to do. Do the spinach soup. Take raw spinach, throw it in a blender, and put some tomatoes in there. Some cilantro. You'll find the medical medium recipes. Spinach soup. Incredible. That can satiate hunger because it gets mineral salts deep into the tissues of the brain, but most importantly, tissues of the liver so that you don't get that mystery hunger and it doesn't creep up and bite you in the butt because that's what it can do. And you can learn how to lower your fats a little bit. I could say it a million times and people are still going to go and just, what? What do you say? I just got to be on my protein. I don't know what he's talking about. And that's sad. And there's nothing wrong with with the plant fats, and there's nothing wrong meaning like the, having them in. And if you like the animal fats, try to get the healthiest sources you can possibly get, without a doubt. And the leanest cuts and get the free range stuff. Absolutely, it's not about attacking anybody. It's not that at all. It's about making sure if you lower your fats a little bit, that you can make room to get every organ what it needs because the insulin resistance won't be there. Stopping something like the liver, which gets bombarded by toxins and rat and all these poisons and everything else and viruses and everything else that the liver gets filled with and burdened 
it gets the liver some glucose so it can start restoring itself. Critical clean carbohydrates, CCC. What this means is everything for the liver. And what this means is everything for your health longevity-wise and long-term. What's longevity? What is it anyway? You know, high fats is the short diet. That's what the high fat movement is and high protein movement is. It's just, it's a short jevity diet is what it is. It is. It's always been. Sorry to say that. It's just always been. Longevity diet is mineral salts with fresh, leafy greens, because that's where mineral salts are, and celery, herbs, and what's the last one? Fruits. And also whole foods, starchy vegetables like butternut squash, you know, butternut squash, red curry, delicata, sweet dumpling, all those different squashes, those winter squashes, critical clean carbohydrates and mineral salts. That's how you live longest. And if you've got chronic illness, that's how you heal your chronic illness. It's not the hemp seeds. I love them, but it's not them. They're good for you. They are. They offer nutrients and minerals and vitamins and everything. And they are good for you. They're a good source of fat for having a handful here and there because that's what you can do, have a handful here and there. But if I don't get stricter on you guys a little bit to try to get you to heal, if I don't tell you the truth and be a little tough once in a while, you're just going to be gobbling down all the fats and proteins and you're never going to get something, you know, like where it has to be for yourself. Yeah. So I have to be a little bit tougher on it all. About it all, I mean. And so, yeah, I mean, so you can have your, do you really love turkey? Then you can have your free-range turkey, organic turkey. Make sure you do double the salads. Double the salads. Make sure you're doing the celery juice. Make sure you're doing a little bit of fruit. Make sure you're doing all those things then. So that your fats don't dominate. Because when they dominate, they dominate. They're going to dominate the quality of your life down the road. That they haven't already, They which they do. They do. Everybody getting chronically ill. They had a high-fat diet the whole time. It's amazing. What do the vegans do? Well, wait a minute. I went, I'm vegan and I got sick. It's because you're a vegan high fat and you got sick. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm paleo and I got sick. It doesn't make any sense because you were high fat paleo. That's how it works. And you just, no one knows where to go and they get confused. There's so much information misleading out there. And you know what? I work for you guys. I don't work for anybody else. I work for you guys. 100% tried and true, I work for you guys. You better believe it. You better believe it's about you. You don't hear an infomercial at the beginning of my radio show trying to sell you some whole bunch of crap. There's a reason for that. That's why all the medical medium information is free online on my website, medicalmedium.com. Go and find it. Look for it. Look, find it in my blog every single day on Instagram, Facebook articles, you name it every single day. My Facebook lives, my Instagram lives every single day. I hand out information. I have, I literally, it's unstoppable diary of the mouth handing out information. Free, 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 free. Nothing but free. Nothing but free, 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 free. Literally. Free, free, free. I can't even say it any more than that. I don't even know what to do anymore. And so, yeah, you have to purchase a book. And you don't even have to purchase the book. The book is so it can get around the world. You're paying for it to get around the world so it can get to other people. When you buy a book, you're donating to basically get it to somebody else is what happens. So it can get into more stores down the road or whatever it's going to be to print it out, to pay for it, to print it out. But you don't even need to pay for the book. Go to the library and get it for free. Reduce your fats, lower them down. And Liver Rescue tells you all about how to do it. It's so easy. It's so easy. It's actually fun. And don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to heal with the right information. Because you got burned with the wrong information over the years. I really love you guys. You need to know that. So aside from taking care of an underlying liver issue, the best approach to saying goodbye to constant hunger is to feed your liver and yourself. Eat often, every one, two hours. Graze. Keep the fats low. Build up your glycogen reserves in your liver. Be mindful that alcohol is a bad sugar. Bad, bad, bad. Sykes out the liver and messes it up. You guys already know that. That's one thing we figured out. Science has figured out that it's bad for the liver. It hasn't figured out why, 
but it's bad for the liver. It's it's the reason why it's bad for the liver isn't just the alcohol. That's not it. It's bad for the liver because it psychs it out. It's methyl sugar. Methyl sugar. It's the worst of all. It's a worse than corn syrup. Alcohol is worse than corn syrup. It's way worse than corn genetically modified corn syrup. <laughs> so anyway, take one day at a time to remember your hunger is nothing to conquer. It's not a shortcoming. It's a call for help from your liver. And don't forget this. We're coming to the end of the show. And now you know exactly how to answer that call and feel satisfied again. Don't let your liver down. Don't let me down. Don't let me down. It's the Beatles. Don't let me down. I can't sing. That's embarrassing as heck. I love you guys. Take one day at a time. And I'll see you soon to the next radio show. Bye-bye. I love you.